Straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Isn't that a powerful (laughs) prayer? It's not a, a realistic prayer. He's not saying that, oh, I'm, I'm not God's great man for the hour. He's coming humbly and saying, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And you know what? The Lord answered the prayer. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, um, we'll start at verse 14. And when he, Jesus, came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tore him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came upon him or unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. This is part three um, of the subject. There is a struggle that comes with prayer. There is a struggle that comes with prayer. And I want to say to you before I get into this message that I hope that these last three messages have been a help to you on a very, very, very important subject. Um, I know it's been a help to me. And the one thing I'll say about God's truth is there's sometimes we need reminded of truths that we already know. Amen? Amen. And when it comes to prayer, there's not a subject that we can get more complacent on than the subject of prayer. So I think we need reminding of certain crucial elementary fundamentals when it comes to prayer because of our own human nature that always seems to want to run away from the house of prayer or the place of prayer. I want to say by way of introduction that proper biblical prayer has to be the greatest privilege and blessing for a human being on planet earth. It is the height of human existence to be able to interact with God. Um, When we do it, I believe we get a touch of heaven on earth. Think about this for one moment. To be able to engage with Almighty God one-to-one, to be welcome in His presence, to be His friend, and to have His ear, and to be able to unburden our hearts to Him in a welcome environment, in a safe environment, has to be the ultimate honor in life. Would you agree? To be welcome, to welcome to actually commune with Him. Prayer is the most worthwhile an impactful activity you will engage in in this life. Prayer should be an incredible experience for you. It is where heaven and earth meet together and communicate. It's where time and eternity connect. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, My house shall be called the house of prayer. 
Now, saying all this, prayer involves real effort. Would you agree? Um, it requires real discipline. And it also requires the implementation of some basic principles if it is going to be effective. It's not just a matter of opening your mouth and winging it. Amen? Um, ignorance is not helpful when it comes to the subject of prayer. Now please know this. Prayer matters. Prayer makes a difference. Prayer allows us, His people, to intimately and supernaturally connect with Him and glean His heart. The prayer of faith lets God answer the cry of our heart and perform His will in His time and in His way. But I do hope as we dig deep and have dug deep in this subject and we've looked at some of the fundamentals of prayer that it does not sound like prayer is a complicated legalistic A to Z. Please, please. That is not what we are trying to get at. That's not what the Bible teaches. But there are certain fundamentals that have to be part of our prayer life or honestly, our prayers are just going to hit the roof. And I don't know about you, I don't want my time, my personal quality time with God to be futile. That I wasted years supposedly talking to God, but God wasn't even listening because I wasn't doing it God's way. So there are some important elements to prayer that we have highlighted over this past few weeks that should improve our prayer life or remind us of what we already know. And if these are applied you should have a solid foundation to engage with God in a very productive way. We established um, the last time that we looked at this subject that we must pray the will of God, which is found in the Word of God, and by being sensitive to the Spirit of God. So please don't be ignorant of this book. I talked to a man in this past week who dealt with a very very, very testing situation in his family. It was terrible. And he shared his testimony and he, he said that for three days, he says every prayer, every scripture that he had ever got to know, every scripture that he had memorized, he says for three days, he just poured it out before the Lord. In desperation, in humility, as a broken man, he would just quote the scripture to God. Your word says, Lord, your word says. He said, after three days, the peace of God came into his heart. And he knew, he knew that God was going to answer his prayer. Hallelujah. And I want that man to come here and share his testimony because it is potent. Honestly, it's like reading something in the book of Acts. What happened? And I heard it and I'm like, it, it just really lifted my whole week. Just the fact that God is still alive. He still hears the cry of his children. And he cares. He actually cares for what we're going through today. Isn't that lovely? Uh, we also established a few weeks ago that we must know and understand the character and the ability of the one that we're praying to. Because an ignorance of that will totally subjugate your effectiveness. If you don't know the God you're praying to, if you don't know who he is and what he's capable of, then why would you even go there? We also learned that prayer is not simply a give me, give me, give me endeavor. It is primarily thanks, praise, and worship. And it is from the heart of appreciation that we can effectively bring our petitions before the Lord. Amen? If you're not coming to God humbly in appreciation of who he is, and with a heart of adoration toward him, then honestly, we can get into the way of just treating God in, in a very disrespectful way. Just telling him what to do. Be aware that God knows our weaknesses. Okay? So when it comes to prayer, join the club here if you feel weak on the subject of prayer. Join the club. Um. He knows our shortcomings. He knows our limitations. 
And when I say that, he knows that sometimes we can't see further than the end of our nose. Amen? We, we want to be the, this great man or woman of prayer for the hour. But I'm telling you, a lot of the time, we just don't know. We really don't know what to pray. He knows our ignorance when it comes to the things of God. That is why he has given us help when it comes to prayer. Um, he's given us his word for guidelines, but he's given us his spirit so that we can understand what the book actually means and also what we need to pray for. We really need his spirit to be allowed to be the Holy Spirit in us. And this is especially necessary in prayers as we communicate with our great God. So we've already established in the past weeks that we don't know what to pray for. So we need help. Amen? The more we grow in the Lord, the humbler we should get when it comes to spiritual duties. And this is not more important than this subject of prayer. So we shouldn't be presumptuous when we come before the Lord. Um, we shouldn't take anything for granted when we come before the Lord. And we should never think that we have arrived on the subject of prayer when we come before Him. We, we need to come humbly as children that really need help. It's okay to come to the Lord like the disciples did of old and cry, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And I wrote down here that some of the prayers that we've probably all prayed over the years are probably some of the most effective. Cameron mentioned one of the prayers, which is help. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't have the words? And the only thing that could come out of your mouth is help. Anybody ever been there? It was so dark or so lonely or just... It, maybe God seemed so far away that that's all you could pray. It's, that's okay. That's okay. Um, it's okay to, to come to God and say, I'm not good enough. It's, it's good to come to God and say, I can't. You know, we think we need to come whenever we feel as if we're, 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 we're doing good and come to God and now we're, we're qualified to engage with Him. I'm telling you, some of our most effective prayers have been when we didn't feel qualified, when we didn't feel we knew anything. Um, it's okay to come and say, I don't know what to do. Or, Lord, unless you show up, uh, I don't know what's happening. Or, unless you do this thing, it's not going to happen. Prayers like that are very humble, but it's okay to actually ask for his help. That's one of the reasons we do come to him in prayer. Psalm 103 verse 14 says, For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. The default system within every one of us is faulty. It's malfunctioning. Without the Spirit, we will go the wrong way every time. Um, here's something I think is key as, as we address this important subject. You need to know that God wants quality time with you. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Yeah. That God actually wants quality time with you personally. Yeah. There's a lot of people that we would love to get quality time with. There's a lot of people we enjoy getting quality time with. But to think that God wants quality time with me, God wants quality time with you, that's pretty awesome. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. With all your warts, with all your faults, with all your feelings, with all your shortcomings, God still wants quality time with you personally. Hallelujah. In fact, you are invited into his presence continually to fellowship at his table. And not only fellowship, but communicate. Hebrews, I'll give you support for that. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly, that word boldly means with assurance and confidence, onto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. In the time of need. Amen. So, I've said all this to say this, okay? 
So I need you to come real close for the next few moments. As important as it is to have a correct revelation of the character of God, as important as it is to be familiar with God's promises and to recognize the prompting of the Spirit of God, as important as it is knowing that prayer is not just asking for, for God to do things and that it involves thanks, praise, and worship. Now, please hear what I'm about to say. If you have all this, yet you do not exercise faith in your petitions, then it renders your prayers impotent. Does that make sense? You can know the word from Genesis to Revelation. You can memorize scripture. That's brilliant. You can actually have a proper revelation of a sovereign God, a faithful God, a worthy God. You can know all that. You can actually know that I'm not just here to say, gimme, Lord, gimme, gimme, gimme. But you can have all that. But if you don't have faith, then your prayers mean nothing. That's a pretty sobering thought for us, especially when it comes to this subject. James 1.6 says, Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Mm. That's pretty sobering. I mean, does that really mean what it says? That if we're not coming with faith and expectancy in our heart, then we can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. By the way, the word for doubt in the Bible, and it comes up a lot on the subject of prayer, it actually means to lack confidence and to consider unlikely. So, you could be praying to God, Lord, would you please do this here? I've crossed my toes, I've crossed my fingers, I'll stand on one foot, and Lord, whatever it, will you do it? But we could, these words could be just empty words because we don't really believe he's going to answer it. So when you come to the Lord, you must expect. We've l- looked over the years that the, the definition of faith is the essence of expectancy. As you pray, do you expect God to answer? By the way, is this how you approach God? Are you doubting when you come to him? Are you skeptical that he's going to really hear your cry? Of course, we've talked about the importance of praying the will of God. But I'm talking about faith here. R.A. Torrey, who's a real authority on the subject of prayer, says this. We must pray in faith. That is, we must pray with confident expectation of getting the very thing that we ask. No matter how positive the promises of God may be, we will never receive them in our own experience till we absolutely believe them. And the prayer that gets what it asks is the prayer of faith. That is, the prayer that is no doubt whatsoever of getting the very thing that is asked. Isn't that big stuff this morning? Mm -hmm. What is faith? Of course, we've got a definition in Hebrews 11.1, but faith is basically a response to God and to his truth. Faith is believing what God says. If God said it, that's it. Amen? Amen. R.C. Sproul makes a very interesting point. The issue of faith is not so much whether we believe in God, but whether we believe the God we believe in. (laughs) Isn't that a good one? Okay, let me repeat that. The issue of faith is not so much whether we believe in God, but whether we believe the God we believe in. I've also heard it put like this. To have faith does not mean you, be, you believe in God. It means you take him seriously. When he says something, 
you take him serious. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely 100% correct what he says to you. Mm -hmm. Basically, if God said it, I believe it. And I will prove my God to be true and faithful because he cannot lie. It's not that you merely want, but that you know. There's a lot of things in life I've prayed for because I wanted them. How about you? Lord, Lord, I kind of like that there, you know. It's kind of, it'd be nice, you know. And a lot of the time we're kind of, it's just the flesh. And our prayers shouldn't really just be our wants, they should be our needs. That's what he answers. And by the way, he knows before you ask whether it's a need or a want. Mm -hmm. You see, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if everyone around you and everything within you and everything that you're looking at says no. If God says something, then do you know what? All nature is subject to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that he asks us to do go beyond the natural realm. I think one of the problems today is that we live in the natural realm, the realm of the possible. So our prayers are all within the realm of the possible. Lord, would you bless me today? That's what God does to his children. Amen? Amen. But I'm telling you to pray prayers that are naturally impossible takes faith. Not just to pray in a desperation, but to pray in hope. Lord, I know, I know that you're going to answer this. See, I've asked a question a few years ago. The question is, do you believe God is able? And most of the time on any given subject, people will say, yeah. I mean, do you believe God is able to meet the financial need of this church to build a new church? Do you believe he's able? Okay. Well, would you, would you agree the next question is a lot different, is do you believe God will? Do, do you see there are two different questions? And I'm telling you, a lot of the time, when we get into the subject of prayer, we are getting into the realm of, do we take him at his word? Do we literally believe that he will? I think a lot of our prayers are in the realm of, well, Lord, you're able you're sovereign God. You created the earth. You created the human body. You created the seasons, the sun, the moon. Yeah, Lord, you are able. But we don't believe he will. And then we wonder why we're not seeing supernatural answers to prayer. Does that make sense? I want to say this, that you're not going to believe what he tells you if you do not trust his character. You're not going to trust his character if you do not believe what he tells you. Can I say that again? You're not going to believe what he tells you if you do not trust his character. You're not going to trust his character if you do not believe what he's telling you. The both are connected together. So, there must be a trust in who he is and what he can do, but there also must be ta taken hold of his revealed will by faith. If we could just recognize that our faith is simply us partnering with God to fulfill his purposes. When we are in tandem with God, things are good. When we're not in tandem tandem with God, we delay the fulfillment of God's promises. So, faith is not simply believing that God is able, it's believing that he will. Does that make sense? Because I think there's a misconception in this subject that I just don't want to paper over this or fly past it without us grasping this. So what about this man in the story that we were reading about this morning who had an epileptic son who came to Jesus for help. We find that in Mark 9.23, Jesus said, if you could just believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Amen. And it says, and straightway the father of the child cried out 
and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Isn't that a powerful <laughs> prayer? It's not a, a realistic prayer. He's not saying that, oh, I'm, I'm not God's great man for the hour. He's coming humbly and saying, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And you know what? The Lord answered the prayer. I want to see the prayers that were prayed in this book that were answered to Christ. Because this is a blueprint for us in 2023 to get answers to prayer. I believe this is a powerful petition. It's an honest prayer. It's a humble cry. And it acknowledges without God, we cannot believe as we ought. R.A. Torrey says this, confirming what we talked about in this past two weeks. To pray the prayer of faith, we must first of all study the word of God, especially the promises of God, and find out what the will of God is and build our prayers on the written promises of God. Intelligent pr faith, and that is the only kind of faith that counts with God, must have a warrant. We cannot believe by just trying to make ourselves believe. Such belief as that is not faith, but credulity, credulity, it is make-believe. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 22, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. That's a big speak. You know, I, like you, I've read these promises over the years, but I still think that I'm learning what they actually mean. Mm -hmm. You think you know what they mean? Intellectually, you, you kind of get it, but it's like, do I get it in my heart what he actually means by this? Do I even get it what faith is? Like, we can all give our definition of faith and it sounds good and we can amen it. and Yeah, brother, amen, good stuff. But a lot of the time, do we really get it? A lot of the times, it's just simply. It's simple, but it's just simply taking him at his word. I think we have a habit of complicating that. Hudson Taylor, that great uh, missionary to China, was sailing to China. And he heard an urgent knock on his door in his stateroom that he was staying in. He opened it up and there stood the captain of the ship. He said, Mr. Taylor, we've no wind. We are drifting toward an island where the people are heathen and I fear that they're cannibals. Taylor says, what, what can I do? He says, I understand that you, the captain says, I understand that you believe in God. I want you to pray for wind. All right, captain, Taylor replied, I will, but you must set the sail. You must get the sails up. The captain says, well, that's, that's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze. Besides, the sailors will think I'm crazy. But finally, because of Taylor's insistence, he agreed. 45 minutes later, he returned. The captain returned and found the missionary still on his knees, praying for this issue. The captain says, you can stop praying now. We've got more wind and we know what to do with it. <laughs> True story. True story. God hears real prayers. He is a supernatural God. I don't know whether any of you have heard of the Scottish preacher, Dr. Guthrie. Uh, he's one of the great theologians in Scotland. And anyway, there was a time of great drought in the land. And... The morning service, they dedicated it to praying for rain. The morning service. As he went to church in the afternoon, that was back in the days where Sunday was the Lord's Day, and they didn't mind going to church two or three times on a Sunday. As he went to church in the afternoon, his daughter Mary said, 
here's your umbrella, Papa. And Guthrie says, what do we need that for? His daughter said, you prayed for rain this morning, and don't you expect God will send it? So anyway, they carried the umbrella. And when they came home, as they were heading home out of the church, they were glad to use the umbrella because the rain came. God hears the prayer of faith. God answers the prayer of faith. Jesus actually taught us in Matthew 21, 21 through 22. Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now, a few chapters before that, Jesus had taught in Matthew 17, 20. If you, feign, if you faith as a grain of mustard seed, that you can, which is one of the smallest seeds, you can say unto that mountain, depart hence from before me. What's he trying to say here? If you faith just the size of a mustard seed, which is really, really small. You can hardly see a seed of mu a mustard seed on your fingertip. It's so small. He says if you have that type of faith, you'll move mountains. Aren't you glad that he didn't say that if you have faith like a mountain, that you can remove a mustard seed? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. You know, that's the way we kind of think. You know, we need to have this the perfect prayers, and we have to have these real impressive mountainous prayers, and then that thing before us will mo move, but he doesn't say that. He says the opposite. And I think if we grasp this, it will absolutely transform our prayers, mine included. See, this faith in God is having a faith in something he's going to do. Remember, moving a mountain is something only God can do. And you say, well, we can't move physical mountains. That, of course, it's talking about figurative mountains. Mm -hmm. But do you understand what a mountain is that's before you? Right. It's an obstacle. It's something that's standing in your way. It's, it's a great burden. It's a great need. And to you, many times I hear people talking about there's a mountain before me. It just seems impossible. But he's given us the answer here to move in that mountain. Prayer is an acknowledgement before God that without him, we cannot do it. It's literally that. The, the cry of our heart is, Lord, it's not going to happen. The human being cannot move these mountains. It needs to be divine intervention. Please hear me. It is not our faith alone that removes mountains, but it is the divine power that is released as we stand upon divine promises by faith that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Matthew 9, 28 says this, And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. Isn't that potent? Mm -hmm. Like there's no, there's no like a 10 minute counseling session here. There's no like, okay, you know, you need to go to Bible college for three years and then you're, you're going to get it, what faith is. This is like momentarily. Like they didn't even probably have time to doubt. Like he's there, they're like, he's been doing all these things and he's right there in their presence. How could they doubt him? They could see him. They knew who he was. They knew his capabilities. And it's like, that's who he is. Well, guess what? He's still the same. He's a miracle working God. So here's the question. What's changed today? Has he changed? 
or have we changed the church? I believe the pro- you know, Lance prayed for the nation this morning. The problem in the nation is not what's happening in Washington, it's what's happening in the church in America. Brother Clendenin said this, the nation's wrong because the church is wrong. The church is wrong because the preacher's wrong. It starts in the pulpit. I read something this week. I, it, it was, I was actually reading, I was amending some of my old notes from back in, a few years ago, and I got, had a quote. Um, Fox News did a survey back uh, quite a few years ago of pastors. And the survey found that 53% of pastors were scared to touch the hot, hot button issues of the day because they were scared of offending the congregation. 53%. Now these were supposedly evangelical pastors. You see, the problem is, the world is blind out there, would you agree? Yeah. The reason why they, they are, make dumb decisions and do dumb things is because they're blind and they're dead, they're in ignorance, would you agree? Yeah. But the church is not in ignorance. We've got our eyes open, amen? Yeah. We can see. Yeah. Paul says, we're not ignorant. We are not ignorant. The problem today is, as God looks on America, as he looks on the church... And he sees that we're not being the church. We're not speaking up. We're not believing him. We're not evangelizing. We're not being a light in in this day. We're simply going through the motions. If we do our Sunday thing, we think we've we've done our bit for the week. We've lost even our, our desire for the house of God. I think there's a severe lack of faith within the church generally in America. We just don't believe. You know, we want revival, but we don't believe revival's coming. We believe God's able. Amen? But do we believe he will bring revival? We hear in scripture about the prayer of faith. But faith in what? Faith in what? It's faith in him, and it's a faith in what he has said to us. The prayer of faith is not you thinking up some really good idea and then convincing yourself that, okay, I'm going to just pray this good idea until it happens. That's not biblical faith. That's just you thinking up a, a, a personal selfish desire. Brother, sister, he wants to be active in your prayer life. Will you let him? R.A. Torrey tells a story about how he used to pray and how it didn't work. Okay? So Torrey says this, Here is the point at which many go astray. Here is the point at which I went astray in my early prayer life. Not long after my conversion, I got hold of this promise of our Lord Jesus in Mark eleven twenty four. I will tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe in that you have received it and it will be yours. Okay? Tori says, I said to myself, all that I need to do if I want anything is to ask God for it and then make myself believe that I am going to get it And I'll have it. Basically, name it, claim it, and frame it. (laughs) Is that the way it works? So the Tory continues. So whenever I wanted anything, I asked God for it and tried to make myself believe I was going to get it, but I didn't get it, for it was only make-believe. And I did not really believe at all. But I later learned that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, and that if I wish to pray the prayer of faith, I must have some warrant for my faith, some grounds on which to rest my faith, and that the surest of all grounds for faith 
was the word of God. So when I desired anything of God, I would search the scriptures to find it if there was some promise that covered that case and then go to God and plead his own promise and thus resting on that promise, I would believe that God had heard and he had and I got what I asked. Isn't that powerful? See, when... When you pray by faith, you should have an unshakable confidence in the promise that he's given you. Lord, your word says. By the way, because God keeps his word. (coughs) Amen? You don't always keep your word, but he keeps his word. So therefore, you come to one who you know if he says it, he keeps it. I like what it says in Hebrews 10, 22, and I'm coming to a close. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. Amen? Amen? He's faithful. He is faithful. Are you faithful all the time? If we have doubt over God's ability to respond to our requests, why would we even ask him? Tory goes on to say this. There is a way in which certain people can pray so as not only to get the very thing that they ask, but also to know before they actually get it that God has heard their prayer and that therefore the thing which they have asked of him, he has granted it to them. Tory continues, In order to know that God has heard our prayer and granted us what we asked, we must pray according to his will. When we who believe on the name of the Son of God pray, for anything that we know to be according to his will, then we may know for the all-sufficient reason that God says so in his word, that God has heard the prayer and granted us what we ask. We may know it, not because we feel it, not because of any inward illumination of the Holy Spirit. We may know it for the very best of all reasons, because God says so in his word and God cannot lie. I'll finish with this verse. Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which which has great recompense of reward. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. This subject, brother, sister, is a challenging one for us all. When it comes to prayer, honestly, I don't give myself big marks out of 10 for prayer. I always feel that I have so much to learn and I have so much to commit to prayer. I'm just telling you, I feel the area in my life that I feel I'm most neglectful for or of is prayer. I just wish, and I've said this to the Lord recently, especially as I've started to just dig deep on the subject. Lord, I want to be a prayer warrior. I really do. I I want to be better at prayer. I, I, I waste so much time on other stuff when I could be praying for real needs. How about you? Like I have never seen a day where we have been more busy or busier. And it's like, is all these things that are taking our time, are they really more important? than being in his presence, talking to him. And the lovely thing about this is we can talk to him in the garden. We can talk to him in the car. We can talk to him in the workplace. We can talk to him when we get up in the morning. We can talk to him when we go to bed. We can talk to him when we wake up in the middle of the night. We can talk to him wherever we are, and yet we don't. Let us pray. Brother, sister, I believe. 
things always start with the people of God. We're his children. We are his people. There's no excuse for us. There's an excuse for the wicked because they're wicked. They're blind. But there's no excuse for us because we're his children. We know his truth. And to be honest, the more we've went into depth about this subject, there's more responsibility on you and me. This is a challenge for me. I, I, it's just reminding me of things I've probably known, but I have neglected. But I want, I want to be a man of God who's a man of prayer. I want this church to be a house of prayer. I want us, the people of God, to be a people of prayer. Um, but we, we can't be happy where we are or else we're, we're part of the problem in America. It starts with us, would you agree? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Do you know that wicked Queen Mary, who was called Bloody Mary because she killed so many believers, feared the prayers of John Knox more than 10,000 soldiers? Do you know why? Because when he prayed, things happened. And when the people of God pray, and I'm telling you, it's time that we prayed real direct prayers in regard to this building. And I'm telling you, if we are in the will of God and we're praying the will of God, it's a very dangerous thing to cut across the people of God. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. I would not want to be in the place of those who would try and hinder the work of God. How about you? Yeah. But we need to be in the place where we are so close to him that we are able to pray prayers that are going to have an impact and they're going to come before the throne of grace. How's your prayer life this morning? How's your love life this morning? How are you and him? Is your prayers effective? Have you even just been pray praying and it, it looks religious and it might impress people? You're praying to a God that's able, and we all know that. But are your prayers believing that he will? That's the prayer of faith. Just believing he will. Is the prayers that you're, are the prayers that you're praying at the moment prayers of faith? Or have you just got into a religious ritual that you pray the same thing every day because that's just the rut that you've got yourself into? Are you praying for your brothers and sisters? Her hurting at the moment. Her struggling at the moment. What about your family? Like you can go and ridicule your family all you want, but are you praying for them? Are you praying for our nation at the moment? Like it's so easy to turn on the TV and see what the problem is. But it's a lot harder to switch the TV off and go into the the closet, and pray for our nation. Amen? Amen? Go to the answer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And just say, Lord, our government is messed up. Our nation is messed up. The school system is messed up. The courts are messed up. America is messed up. Lord, would you raise up men and women of God that would actually preach the gospel to them and shine a light? Do you not think that would be more effective? Father, we come before you in prayer. Lord, after a message like this, Lord, it seems like words are just so small and so insignificant. But Lord, we do ask for forgiveness on this subject of prayer. Forgive us for our unbelief. Forgive us for our neglect. Forgive us for our selfishness even in our prayers. Forgive us for not coming up to the mark of where we were meant to be when you wanted us to be there and yet we refused to do it. I pray that this church will be full of intercessors, prayer warriors. Lord, it's just not a calling to one person or, or a couple of elect people in this 
church to be prayer warriors. You've called your people, period, to be prayer warriors. God, I pray that you would just stir us today with prayers. Lord, that we would take time aside even in this busy day just to take alone time with you, just to thank you, to praise you, to worship you, and then ask with our petitions to you, Lord. Help us, O God. Help us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen.